dwelling in the darkest depths of the mind. It's time for Mark D. Valenti and Brain Burrow. Hello everyone, this is Mark D. Valenti and this is Brain Burrow. This is one of our Digging Deep sessions where we have a chance to talk with our guest. They have an opportunity to share about their life, their motivations, their fears, their values, their struggles. And then you have an opportunity as the listener and viewer to decide how does this relate to my life? So I'm very pleased to have on the show today, Mr. Anthony St. Thomas. And as always, I want to hand it over to Anthony by asking the big open-ended question, who exactly is Anthony St. Thomas? Mm, Which uh, on occasion has been a tough question, but uh, the best that I've come up with is a caffeine addicted, (laughs) <laughs> struggling, frustrated, multi-disciplined artists, and Black man in America. Wow. That about sums it up. That's a pretty powerful and succinct answer. So you said about multi-disciplined artists. What, what exactly does that mean, Anthony? Well, I'm an illustrator. Okay. I'm a photographer. I've been known to paint. I do poetry. I've done rap music, I've arranged music, and uh, I'm a published author. I've also written screenplays, so. Um, Wow, that's quite the uh, resume. Oh, God, one more. I've also also acted in film. That, that, for some reason, I I always push that off to the side, but I've spent Hmm most of my adult life living with an actress Hmm. so when you live with someone who's who's major discipline is something you compare yourself to that and sometimes you don't feel like that at all Hmm. interesting so since you brought that up let's talk about that how does it feel as you're comparing yourself because clearly it's something that's on your mind because you brought it up oh well you know it's it's just something that's always been in the forefront of my mind when I've done film is that I am not Monique Dupree and that's fine by me I you know I have no desire to be Monique Dupree (laughs) I'm pretty comfortable in my skin but I've seen her perform at such a level and a lot of a lot of her audience will never see but I've seen her perform at such a level that I've been left stunned by the by her performances and uh you know some things that we'll never see video because they're on a cutting room floor somewhere or, or you know there wasn't enough time or whatever the case may be so and being around her and being on films other actors uh other artists that i know you know tony todd i've seen him practice for stage performances and it, you know it feels it feels like pumping myself up for failure to compare myself as an actor to Tony Todd. Now, have I been in films? Yes. Can I act? Certainly. But an actor is, that's a, that's a craftsman's title. Yeah, that's a really, I love the way you frame that, right? I mean, I think there's a lot of people that may underestimate what it takes to be an actor. And I think your, your very humble approach just now, I think kind of sums it up. Now you mentioned about being comfortable in your own skin, being comfortable with Anthony St. Thomas. So what makes you so comfortable? Cause a lot of people aren't comfortable in their own skin. What makes you so comfortable, Anthony? Well, a long time ago, I had to accept that this is my time as Anthony St. Thomas, you know, no matter what I believe in, no matter what what spiritual course I take, no matter how successful I am at any given thing at any given time, I am in this time frame, from the beginning of this to whenever this ends, I am Anthony St. Thomas. I just better get used to it. There's been times that, you know, I don't like being Anthony St. Thomas. And, you know, again, I had to get comfortable with myself. I had to get comfortable with 
intellectually, if I was going to do something with my life, it probably wouldn't be an artist of any kind. Intellectually, I probably would have went into medicine or law or, you know, anything that turns a buck faster and, you know, gives me less time in a spotlight. Those have probably have been the things that I would have chosen intellectually. That's not what I'm designed for though. Thusly, here I am <laughs> in front of you with a light on me. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's uh, actually a very beautiful thing to say about really accepting yourself and who you are, as you said, from beginning to end in this life. And I, I really appreciate you kind of talking about that. Now, it's interesting, you chose medicine as an example of something intellectually. What made you decide to choose that as an example of something you would do, again, in a different pathway? Well, uh, even when I was in the Army during high school, uh, one of the, the other things that I'm acclimated towards is sciences. So there had always been a lot of talk about me either going into the sciences or being a doctor of some kind. You know, uh, in the Army, uh, after basic training, we went through all these rigorous tests. And one of the things that I scored off the charts in was field medicine. I could set bones and, you know, so on and so forth. So it, it's always been there in the shadows, but there's a, there's a marriage between the sciences and the arts that people don't really take seriously, but you have to. You know, every writer, as far as I'm concerned, is sitting on the prefaces of being a, a, a physicist because we are diving into things in such a way and looking at things in such a way that we're breaking it down to the particles of it. We might put them together as backwards and ridiculous. We might. And in fact, it's our job to and then convince you that this is how it works anyway. So the arts and the sciences are married. And so it's not really that surprising, but yeah, medicine as an intellectual pursuit. Yeah, that's fascinating, actually. And I really like what you say about marrying the arts and the sciences. And as you said, oftentimes people overlook that. Uh, you also talked a bit about um, feeling comfortable in your own skin, but also said the very human statement of sometimes... You're not. Sometimes you don't like. Again, rare, rare, right? Well, but yeah. tell me about tell me about those times whenever you don't feel comfortable in your own skin or don't feel comfortable being Anthony St. Thomas. Well, you know, I, I struggle with being a very heavily mental person, and sometimes that gets in the way of being when when the people around you who depend on you need you to be a more emotional being. And, you know, in retrospect to a lot of people, it's great. A tragedy comes along, uh, you're in the middle of an emergency and I appear to have a cool head. It's just the way I'm built, you know. I, and I can handle most situations that way. And at the time, no. While in retrospect, a lot of people appreciated, oh, you kept your wits about you, so on and so forth. At the time, I'm the robot, <laughs> you know. <laughs> I'm the cold-hearted bastard. So I, I, I've had to struggle with that, with the the and a couple of other battles within myself, you know. Just and it's, it is human to basically, especially if you're going through your life at any particular point in time, looking to improve yourself, especially for yourself, where you're not using anyone else's yardstick to measure your success. You're only going by what you want of you. When you come short of those measurements, there's nobody to have that conversation with. Hmm. comfortably you know mm -hmm. because now you're the guy talking to yourself and you you should have done better than that <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, you can um, be your own worst enemy in that way. Absolutely, absolutely. I, I mean, even the even like there's characters or uh, or like growing up, listening and watching and reading the things that I did. A lot of the characters that I appreciate most have always suffered from the same thing. Uh, one of my favorite characters is Doctor Who. Now there's storylines where the doctor, since he goes through time and he changes physical form, has been in a room or in a situation where he's actually there with himself. And the first thing you notice is that this man, sometimes woman, doesn't necessarily get along with himself at all. He's the same guy. It's the same person on the same mission, using the same tactics, give or take a little bit of alteration. But the mission is the same. The mission statement is the same. The movements are specific to him, you know. But whether or not he agrees with himself is a completely different thing. Comes to the same conclusions. However, just really can't take his own arrogance. Uh, uh, basically, he puts on the performance of being ridiculous and a clown. Mm -hmm. But if he's in the room with himself, that pisses him off. Mm. So, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, and I've gravitated towards characters that have that issue with themselves. Hmm. Fascinating. I'm actually am familiar with Doctor Who and probably not as big a fan as, as you are, but I can I can definitely remember some things like that where he, like you said, is in conflict with himself, but it clearly has a huge impact on you and you see a parallel in some ways with your own life. Absolutely. So can, can you talk about a time whenever perhaps you have felt conflicted with yourself, with your own self, maybe from the day before, the year before, or even the minute before, whenever you find yourself in conflict? Well, I've been there uh, quite a few times. Uh, I think one of the biggest times was right after art school, I went to the army. I pretty much graduated from art school grabbed my associate's degree, got off stage, and was in Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri, two weeks later. <laughs> didn't, didn't waste any time there at all. Well, and, and, you know, I look at it now as the conflict between being this poet, artist person, this, this, uh, and, and also being the guy who grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods in, in, in North New Jersey, shades of a tough guy, because I don't consider myself a tough guy. But like, I, I even to this day joke that uh, I'm the world's hardest nerd, you know. <laughs> we we like came, up with a, came up with a word, nard. <laughs> Which is combination of hard nerd. <laughs> <laughs> kind of like that. <laughs> you should get it copyrighted. Okay. Okay. I like it. <laughs> okay. So that was a time when you specifically at that graduation and going into that, that was a time when you experienced a conflict. I, I did experience a conflict. I, I experienced a conflict in trusting and believing that art was going to be the begin all end all for what I do and even in the even in the military my my short stint in the military I was at conflict with it because I don't like being given orders I, I you know so a lot of it was about discipline like doubling down on discipline for myself but uh yeah, I spent that entire time in conflict. I, I spent that time in conflict between being the warrior and the artist because I couldn't, uh, I couldn't justify the two of them being in the same being. I, I don't have that problem as much anymore. You know, it's actually ridiculous to start 
labeling yourself or trying to hold yourself to some two-dimensional characterization. You, if you're going to be a, a whole human being, at some point, you're going to have to realize that you can be all of those things, and it's not a problem. Yeah, that's really insightful, and it shows a lot of growth on your part as you go back and look at, you know, Anthony from decades ago and that conflict and how much it sounds like it took a lot of your psychological and emotional energy to have this conflict going on in your brain. Well, the, my, my mind works really oddly. Okay. And while you're right, it did take a lot of my energy. I, I, I can honestly say to you that if there were 20 people in the room looking at me, they had no idea. Hmm. So it didn't come out in any outward way that people could notice. No. And, and I think at, even at this point in my life, uh, being that I've changed so much. Well, I like to use the word grown because uh, change is relative. It's like time. But uh, I've grown so much, but still to this day, I think that maybe there's only a handful of people who can tell when my mood has changed and when I'm in a room. And again, that's just how I'm built. I, I don't register a certain way. And it took me a while to deal with that. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, and it goes back to what you said before, where, you know, people look at you as sort of that stability and rock. And we know Anthony's not going to get upset in this situation. And we're looking for him as, as like that uh, person who doesn't get emotional. But it also sounds like, you know, there obviously is a negative to that as well. Oh, it, it can be a big negative. Yeah. So I want to talk about uh, the growth here, right? Your, your growth over time, because I think you brought up something. And I think as we're, as we're talking and thinking the theme here is really about, you know, coming to resolution with a conflict within oneself, right? And it sounds like you've done a tremendous job of, as you said, you're not two-dimensional. None of us are two-dimensional and coming to a conclusion that, yeah, you are all these things and that's okay. So can you talk a bit about how you came to that revelation because that's a big revelation to come to well I, <laughs> it started a long time ago i mean it crested mm, more recently uh, i i when i was younger i started dealing with it and that's all i was doing i, I was dealing with it whether it was well or not is you know <laughs> up for up for debate <laughs> but I started letting go of trying to force myself to do one of the things that I do at any given particular time like some days I am an artist and usually when I'm the artist that's about all you're going to get out of me don't expect me to write you a sonnet don't look at me to grab my camera and be a photographer that day. Usually that's what I'm going to be today. I'm going to be an artist. And I, I used to try to channel that energy, finish things a certain way. And at some point I stopped and said, I'm going to let that use me the way it needs to. So if I can't put down my camera today and there's no one to shoot, there's no scene to set up, you can be sure that whatever my scenery is, I'm going out and I'm capturing it. And that's what I'm going to do. That's until that is satisfied. Uh, I write long stories, but uh, even my long stories, I don't try to write in any particular way. It comes to me. That's how I put it down. Sometimes I started the end of a story and I have no idea what the beginning was. And I let, I let that energy carry me when it's carrying me to where it's carrying me. And I've learned to trust it because it is part of me. It's, it, that energy is emanating from me or through me, depending on you know what, what your spiritual belief is. Because, you know, part of me believes that there's no idea that belongs to a person. 
that they're almost viral there in the air, you know. But uh, I let that energy carry me to where it's going to carry me. Same thing with the art, all of it. About the only thing I will try to do on command is if I'm in someone's movie and they're asking me to act. And then I'll, you know, then I'll perform. Sure. Because that's what I'm there to do. Again, an another thing, another reason why I will say I can act, but I think that's another thing that separates me from what's horribly considered an actor or an actress is that a lot of times, God, these people can snatch some uh, another entity out of the air and take it into themselves and be an entirely different person. And, and that's just amazing to watch. And I can't do it quite as well. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's uh, clearly a, a skill set and, and a you know, just a, an amazing inspirational action that these actors and actresses have, to your point. Um, you, I, I actually really like almost the visual that I got there whenever you're talking about, you know, this day you're going to be, you know, a writer, this day you're going to be a photographer. It's almost like you have a set of clothes of either who you're going to be that day, and that's who you're going to be that day, and you're going to focus only on that. And I think there's a, a really positive message of mindfulness, of focusing just on that and not being distracted by anything else. That's and and that's what it's come down to. Yeah. You, and I mean, I, I'm good with not getting distracted and having a lot of balls in the air, and I work well under pressure. But that unnecessary pressure that I used to put on myself doesn't need to be there. So I can spend time with my kids, and you know laugh and play with them and you know come back and be the artist right back in vogue but if i go to try to write something for for something that i have no connection to at this moment then that's going to throw my day completely out of well and i think that's been a theme of a lot of things you talked about so far it's about almost being really focused with your energy so you're not all over the place and there's a concept called essentialism, which is, it's a book actually called The Disciplined Pursuit of Less, which is all about just kind of focusing on this thing as opposed to going everywhere, which doesn't allow you to be the best person you're going to be because you're distracted and your energy's everywhere. But I really like what you're saying. Go ahead. And I can get there, you know, I, I you know, uh, people who care about me will say, you know, okay, that you, you do have to get that done, but let's. While, while you've got the drill in your hand and you're building that wall, but you might not want to be <laughs> dealing with that. And they're right, you know. So understand that where I have this the best in check is with my artistic self. But then the artistic self is the, the self that I've had to deal with the longest, in all honesty. Yeah, and again, thank you for sharing, you know, that you are human and then your ability to focus as you do in the arts doesn't necessarily, you know, transfer over to other areas always. No, it doesn't. Right. Uh, also, I like what you said before about, I'm, I'm obviously trying to take notes as you're talking, because you're saying just so many like really cool things that, that really describe who you are. Did a great job of answering that question. Who exactly is Anthony St. Thomas? But it's, a, it's, you talked about trusting it. You talked about when you're in that flow and in the energy and, you know, whether you're out there and you're going to take photographs that day and you're just trusting it. I think that was very powerful. How did you get to a point where you just kind of trusted your instincts and how you're feeling that day? Mm, that comes down to having those instincts be the thing that keeps you alive. I said before that I grew up in one of the worst neighborhoods in North New Jersey. Uh, I grew up in what was... Uh, stellar right projects um i grew up on prince street in newark now this is through the 70s and the 80s living in these buildings where while my mother kept an incredibly calm and loving home in these buildings me leaving that very safe environment and going 
anywhere, I pass through a gauntlet, you know, almost, uh, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say that it felt like the Hunger Games sometimes. Wow. wow. <laughs> you know? So it could get it could get rough. I could be coming home or walking out of home to gunfire, to robbery, to uh, you know, stepping over junkies. Now, at the same time, I made incredible friends. I and my instincts sharpened uh, very well. The something I took to uh, took with me to the military. Now I didn't see combat or anything. You know, it, I was I was a soldier at peacetime. But uh, you know, I still took those instincts with me, and it was recognized a few times that, like you know. Sometimes I was sharper than the guy who grew up, you know, in a much safer environment. So yeah, it had trusting my instincts came from my instincts having been faithfully saving my life, keeping me alive. So if I was going to trust them with my bodily well-being, I, I had to put some kind of faith into them with these things that basically were extensions of myself. And I learned to trust my instincts on a lot of levels, dealing with people, uh, dealing with situations, uh, and basically dealing with even the emotional things that I did have that were capable of overflowing because some of them were really reserved, but you know, I also was one to get really pissed off, <laughs> you know, that was a really easy emotion to plug into at one point was, was anger. Sure. So, but um, yeah, so that's why I trusted my instincts. They kept me alive. If they were going to keep me alive, then they were going to carry me through the rest of it. Yeah, that's a really well said and how it was almost a necessity, as you said, for survival, then growing up that you really learned to trust your instincts. So thank you for for sharing that. And the other thing I noticed about you is you seem to be really, you know, in touch with the reasons why you do things, you know, because I'm asking questions about just and assessing yourself and why you do things. And you seem to already have a pretty good handle on why you do things and what you've gone through. So I think that in of itself is pretty impressive. So how are you able to be so in touch with yourself? Hmm. I had to be, I had to be, uh, because I, I think we all do the, the game of comparison. And while, uh, you know, it's not always the healthiest thing to do, I think in the right context, it could teach you a lot about yourself and other people. I never seemed to function like the people around me. And that really became a question of, you know, why then, you know, then how are you functioning? Everyone else seems to be doing this. This isn't even registering to you to behave this way or move this direction. You know, whether it was negative or positive, you know, negative and positive wasn't even the issue. It was just that there was a large removal from the behavior of others. And at first I thought it was my neighborhood, but it wasn't just my neighborhood. It was in most situations. So I, I had to really ask myself why? You know, why was I catching things that a lot of people weren't? Mm. I remember I remember being about seven years old, six, seven years old. It was six. My sister, my older sister, Sharon, was 16. And we were watching Bugs Bunny cartoons. She was doing her homework, eating popcorn. And... Uh, 
something blew up or something and Bugs Bunny, it was falling towards the ground and Bugs Bunny stepped off of it and walked away once it got to the ground. And my sister literally said, you know, why doesn't, why wouldn't that work? Why, why don't people just relax and step off of something before it, right before it hits the ground? Older, you'd hit the ground with the absolute same momentum because you're falling with it and gravity pulls everything the same. I was six. Now, <laughs> my mother talks about this every once in a while that, you know, when I was about four or five, I opened my mouth and said something to her and she was like, oh, hell, I'm in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> she knew then, huh? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But, you know, I, I did understand that you, you're going to fall. You're still falling, technically. And she was like, yeah, you don't know what you're talking about. You're six. <laughs> yeah. So, no, I think that, you know, I think to, to go back to your point about looking at other people, you know, as an individual, and you've identified yourself as somebody who's very in touch with their own intrinsic motivation, that's clear. You also still have looked at other people to try to understand more about yourself. And I think as human beings, we're social beings. So we're always looking at other people. So I think what you've described is a, is a great balance between the two. Now, we are actually at 30 minutes, uh, Anthony. So I want to just sort of ask one final question. And that is, you know, what do you want people watching or listening, you know, to this interview? What do you want them to walk away knowing about Anthony St. Thomas? Hmm. Now, see, that's a really... That's a really difficult question. Hmm. I mean, on one level, being any kind of artist, any kind of performer, you want people to walk away, if not appreciating your work, having given your work, the opportunity to impress them. You want that. But me as an individual, separate from my work, <laughs> I'm not sure what, what I would actually want from anyone uh, on, on such a massive scale as watching me in a little box. It, when, it, when it gets down to that, when it gets down to numbers and society, it goes right back to like, you know, hey, check out my work. Because I don't think me personally, I need that much attention and uh, admiration. I don't think I need it that much. That is a wonderful answer. Truly, there's no right or wrong answer to any of this, but I think that's an extremely insightful answer that actually does allow people to get even more of a glimpse of, of, of you, Anthony. So thank you for sharing that. Well, thank you for having me. And this has been quite interesting. Quite interesting. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. And I appreciate you answering the questions. And really, uh, it has been an interesting conversation on my end to listening to just the different things that you've done and the different ways you've navigated life. So I really want to express my appreciation for you being on the show today, Anthony. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, my pleasure. Okay. Well, then on that note, I want to, of course, thank the listeners and viewers out there for tuning into Brainboro. And on behalf of Anthony St. Thomas, I hope you all have an amazing rest of your day. You just dug deep with Mark D. Do you want more? Follow Mark on Instagram at Valenti Horror and subscribe to the Brainboro podcast. <laughs>